Uh, so we got the true believers here, the, the 4 o'clock on Friday session. Uh, so I want to say congratulations. I'll try to make this interesting and worth your while for sticking through this. Uh, let me go back, and I don't normally do this, but uh, I want to explain a couple things on my background. Ex-Air Force guy. So uh, a lot of the context of, uh, were you Army? Was that it? Navy. Navy? Well, you, you have to start somewhere. Um, <laughs> the, who has a better golf game now? for the record. Uh, so a little bit of background, and a lot of the, what I'm going to talk about today is in the context of uh, many of the fun things I did in the mid-90s with what used to be called the Air Force CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team. So I got to do uh, you know, network intrusion detection in the mid-90s on the receiving end of a lot of the worldwide attacks on the AF.net or Air Force, Air Force .mil, uh network. And so uh, a lot of the interesting kind of anomaly detection and pattern detection stuff that I'm going to talk about today uh, is really rooted in the experiences I had back then. Uh, you know, now I run Denim Group with two other partners. You've probably met Dan Cornell, seen him uh, running around, and uh, run a company called Denim Group down in San Antonio who does software security stuff. Surprisingly enough, uh, we're here at OWASP. Uh, so let's just jump right into the slides real quickly. So what, what I'm going to speak about today is really the whole world of what happens after you deploy an application. And, I, and I've made a central argument, and a uh, forceful argument at times, that a, a lot of what we spend time and energy and resources on within enterprise environments is you know, to, to fix the SDLC or to train up the developers or to do pen testing or to, to make sure the source code is devoid of, of vulnerabilities or at least close to that. And what I'm going to talk about today is really what you do between the time that you deploy an app and the time you end of life that app, when it's out in production. And, and what do you do to instrument in hooks so that you can get a little bit more context if you're being attacked? Uh, because there's a little bit of a, a fire and forget mode, at least in certain enterprises. And, and I'm going to talk always in the context of software built in big companies, not you know, by Adobe or Microsoft or you know, independent software vendors. Really, if you're building big software in large-scale environments, typically web, but you, within the context of uh, mobile, you could, you could extrapolate what I'm talking about uh, to mobile. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about like, kind of the, the target area. I'm going to blow through a handful of slides because this is OWASP, but I'm going to focus more on the application logging and context part of this session. So I've been told I've got about 35 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, I will uh, try to be respectful to that and, uh, and leave enough time for questions and answers. So given that we've got an intimate audience here, it's a Friday afternoon, I would ask if, if I don't explain something well, if you have a question, just jump up and say something. So uh, anyhow, we'll go from there. So um, you know, if you are looking at kind of the network world, for those that come from that network world or are familiar with it, I want to just draw a comparison for starts. And, and again, I came, came from that network security, network intrusion detection world. And you know, if you are having, if you're on the receiving end of an incident, or you're, you think that you are being attacked, I mean, obviously, it's, there's nobody that announces that. But there's a couple of key things that happen. First of all, you, you want as much information as possible, as much information as you can. And, and there's not, again, somebody that's telling you that this is happening. You, know, you just start to see weird stuff. And, and uh, we were talking about this earlier with Peter and crew, like the, the, the you know, kind of, what's the baseline? What, do you, what, what are the kind of things that you start off and look and understand what the base case is? So the first thing you want to do is get as much information as possible. So for those that are familiar with the security event or security incident and event management world, SIM and SIM, that's what this is. It's like you're, you want to suck logs, you want, you want the logs and, and, and the ability to kind of interpret and correlate what you're getting in a relevant amount of time. Uh, and, and, and if you've done this well, you start to get patterns and determine patterns and identify patterns. And that's what's happened in the network world. And I, and I would argue that the network world is exceptionally mature in this area. There's a lot of resources, uh, a lot of uh, uh, product in this world. And a lot of, uh, I mean, like if you've heard of these vendors, some of them are downstairs. Most of them are at RSA and others. Uh, but this is a, there's a built-in constituency and a built-in set of people that know how to do network intrusion detection. And I would compare this drastically to the world of applications. Uh, when, in fact, if you're in an operational environment, there isn't a distinction. If you're being attacked, you want the network information, but you also want the application layer information, too. The big difference is, if you're building custom applications, that information is rarely presented to you. Does that make sense? 
I mean, if, if, if you have a custom dev team and custom dev effort, they're not coming to you saying, hey, here's the information we're trying to expose to your security monitoring tool. They don't talk that way. They don't think about it. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, how many people are familiar with the Gartner Group Magic Quadrant? If, if Gartner says it, I believe it, that settles it, right? You know, they've been anointed. They're in the Magic Quadrant. So every product marketing person on the planet is trying to get to the upper right corner, not in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, bottom left-hand corner. So if, I guess if you're, I won't name out these guys, that's bad, that's good up there. Uh, IBM's up in the upper right-hand corner for our friends from IBM. The point here is, if you notice, there's lots of dots. There's lots of companies. This is a mature marketplace. There's lots of people that do security event and security incident event management. Uh, and, and so this is stuff that if you went back to the late 90s and, you know, there are companies that started to do this and started sucking logs and, oh, gosh, we get this and get that. But so, so they're, you know, kind of the basics in blocking and tackling this area was like, you know, what happened, when, does, and, 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 and how, but in a format that I can then, you know, obviously import in a predictable way, structured data that I can Im import in a predictable way, uh, and that they can go into these systems. Then I can start to understand, and I can either turn them up or turn them off, turn the gain up or down during uh, certain incidents. And when we're in the Air Force, uh, we would look at certain types of TCP ports within certain systems, and if we perceived activity, suspicious activity, we would turn up the gain. We would start to log more information and more ports. Uh, we looked at systems around that to see what you know, the DNS is doing at the same time. We'd look at more context. And, and so that's what you're wanting on the network side. But unfortunately, obviously, we're here at OWASP, and I won't really hit you on the head about this, but I mean, applications obviously are, are, are a preferred uh, area of attack, if not the preferred area of attack, if you're at OWASP. And so you've got a lot of folks that are worried about this. So if you go back to the, these, this world right here, um, they're getting a little bit more app aware, but it's still a learning curve. They're still trying to solve big, big, big problems in the, uh, in, the in the network world uh, of, you know, uh, you go to the Air Force now, they're worried about gigabit Ethernet monitoring. They're worried about big, you know, big data, big stuff, correlation across multiple bases. They're not worried about, they're less worried about what's happening at layer seven. So the challenge there is, I mean, uh, you throw in the issue of, of the division between the dev group and the, and the security group in most places, and you have this, this real big challenge. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to blow through this real quickly, but, you know, essentially j injection uh, vulnerabilities change the, 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 you know, or just an example of how uh, the network side of the house typically doesn't monitor, manage, or worry about this stuff, and you know what SQL injections do. I don't have to explain this to you. Bad things. You can drop databases. Again, uh, network intrusion detection stuff is starting to pick up some of these capabilities, but for the most part, they're not. But so um, the main thing here is that we've got to understand is uh, the network side of the house is focused on, on, on big things, and then the application side is a little bit different. So what happens in the application side is the chasm that exists between the dev groups typically and the, the security groups uh, is, is really pronounced in this area. Um, this is changing a little bit if you heard from Jason Chan and uh, what they're doing with DevOps and if you heard uh, Josh Corman and Rugged and kind of this more kind of near real time production world. Okay, that's it's a little bit changing, but I would argue that, that, that outside the earliest adopters, that they're, they're rare. I mean, for most places, you still have centralized security team, maybe a centralized person that worries about software security, uh, typically a dude, sorry. Uh, and then. Um, but then you have multiple dev teams that mo might be in different locations, different management. They typically report up through different groups. And so this chasm really, really hurts in this particular area because what happens is they're obviously building enterprise software. They don't think about security. They only do it if it's an afterthought or if they're in a banking or the, the most security conscious financial organizations. But the real big point on this slide is if they do logging, are they worried about this at all? They are worried about uh, focusing on debugging broken software, right? So if you go to a developer and say, hey, I'd like you to add some logging, what do you log for? When you, when you build an app, you're really looking to log to debug the app if it crashes in a weird state or if it does something weird. You want to know what, you want to be able to essentially uh, figure out after the fact what happened and how I can fix it as quickly as possible. So does everybody here understand like you have to I mean, like when you're building custom software in an enterprise, in order to 
put out that information for debugging purposes, you have to write that in. You know, you have to basically create that. It isn't created by definition. So compare this with software security pro or excuse me, security products. You know, they almost all of the firewall, I mean probably all of them now, all of the security products by definition send information out in a structured way because that's what they do. I mean, if you're building a security product, you're not going to build a security product that doesn't send information out to a, a SEM or SEIM. That's, all, that's what they do. But if you're building an enterprise e-commerce engine, that isn't at the top of your list. You're looking to debug it in case an order gets uh, confused or there's you know, shipping problems. Or you're looking to essentially debug and fix uh, the problems with an, the application itself, maybe not the security stuff. So the, the real big thought on this slide is if you don't articulate what you want log it, logged, it isn't magically going to be logged, if everybody understands that. Again, if you're in custom environments, they're by definition custom, and if you're not being invited to those meetings, you're not contributing or saying, here's what I need and here's what it needs to look like and here's how frequently I need it, they're going to do what they need to do and nothing more than that. So that's, that's a real big challenge. So in most enterprise environments, the, the, the fidelity of logging for security and so application security attack purposes is dramatically lower. So I'm just going to give you a quick example, a couple of uh, code level examples of something here where, you know, uh, if you write this and, and you, you write off to print uh, this particular command, you're, you're getting information out, but it doesn't tell you anything. And this in, in instance is even worse, where if you're logging something, somebody tries to log in, you're appending like the password to a particular log. That's even dumber. So like, like it's one thing to not get the information, but it's another thing to log, like inject a password or PII or a social security number into a, uh, a log. I mean like not logging bad, logging like uh, creating a security problem in your logs is, 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 is even worse. Um, and then even worse example, you know, like, like that. Th this is, we've seen this. We don't see it frequently anymore, but this is an example. Like, hey, I want to, I want to know if that person didn't put in the credit card number correctly. I mean, uh, well, that's, that's a, a thing that maybe a, a developer would like to do to debug, but bad. So, um, you know, the first and foremost thing is don't, you know, do logging and, and create more security headaches by definition. You don't want to do that. I mean, like, uh, and, and, uh, and you need to think back. You need to sit down and, and, and work with the, the development team or the development team folks need to work with you to figure out what, what do I need during an attack. Um, and you have to do it in a human interpretable form. That's the other thing. When uh, you're in the middle of an incident, like part of the challenge is to, is to detect the anomaly. And by the, what you're doing is you're trying to get rid of all the chaff. You're trying to understand what is that key thing that jumps out at me? And half the battle, if not more than half the battle, is to throw everything out that doesn't matter to me. So um, in the case of applications, there's, there's, there are definitely formats out there uh, that are understood and predictable, and we'll go through that, uh, but things that can be sucked into your security event manager. Um, and then the, the key thing here is that the developers, obviously, and security people talk in different contexts. Uh, they talk in different languages, and one of the things that uh, uh, we, we see all the time is if you talk to a, a developer, they don't understand what a application vulnerability is typically. They'll understand what a, a software defect is, or a security software defect, but they use different language. Uh, so part of it is creating the translation table or the translation mechanism. So you can talk to them saying, this is what I need, this is what it looks like. Um, and, the, and then the last thing is, uh, do it in a way that, that is trusted. So uh, I'll just tell you a quick war story uh, on our side. We typically don't do, as a company, incident response. We try to run away from incident response because it's highly disruptive and not fun and, you know. Uh, but we walked into a particular client about three or four years ago, and they said, hey, we've got a real big problem. Uh, our CEO and CIO had their Outlook profiles deleted. And out of 15,000 people, I was like, well, that's, that's probably not a random event, right? Uh, the CIO and the CEO. And so we started asking very technical questions like, what happened? You know, have you fired anybody? <laughs> and within like five minutes, they, they oh, yeah, we fired our... Uh, 
our exchange administrator last week and this and that and uh and i was like wow you know we, i'm going to come across as a really smart guy and say there's something related to that that happened there's your trigger event right and so what what we figured out real quickly though is uh and this is not a custom application this is just exchange um the the, the same administrators had exchange and ad um, you know a user uh super user rights so what do these crafty guys do they flush the logs for 72 hours. So they went in and, and, uh, and, and, and essentially blew up the CEO and CIO's outlook so they didn't have contacts, you know, anything, uh, any of their stuff. But they were not sophisticated enough to do it in a way that was subtle. They just blasted the logs. So one of the things that we said to them is we don't know who, it, who did it, but we suspect it was probably one of those guys because they didn't know how to do that in a way that didn't set off big triggers, i.e., there's missing logs for three days. So I asked them, you know, do you do trusted logging? So like one of the things you have to do here is to make sure you log off, log the information off to a, a place that does it in a one-way encrypted fashion so that the administrators can't edit or tamper with the logs or delete them all. So, you know, if you don't tell the developers to do that or you don't work with the developers to take those logs and do that in a way that's interpretable and trusted, if you do have an incident, they're certainly not admissible in any courtroom or any type of, for any litigation. So that, that story was a, a very crude example, but extrapolate that to custom software as well. Like, like you know, wh wh where'd you save the logs? Well, they're right here, <laughs> you know, right here. Well, you know, that, that's, that's gonna be the first thing that attackers do. They're either gonna put in a root kit and say, don't log to that, or they're, if they're sophisticated, or they're just not gonna be able, you're not gonna be able to tell that they're on the box. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, okay, so I've already kind of mentioned this. But if you're on the security side, part of the, uh, the, the job, your job is to find out how to get invited to that design meeting for the new software project. You know, be it on the mobile side, be it on the uh, the website. How do you get? You know, how, how do you get? How do you know that a new software project is being uh, executed, and that at the design phase you can be there saying, "Time out, hey, this is just you know, here's how I need our stuff." You know. Uh, Absent of that, you will not get anything. So the other side is that security operators must understand the application layer better because they need to be able to tell what is what should be logged. I'll give you a great example. If you don't understand the back and forth of HTTP and you don't understand like what is an anomaly, then that's very hard. I mean, then, 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 then it's a very difficult to articulate to the application team what to log. I mean, like that's the starting point. Um, and then the other thing is developers need to understand and, and, and figure out, you know, what, what is meaningful and what, uh, what is interpretable. I mean, how many people, uh, I mean, I'm not a Windows uh, developer, a desktop developer, but, you know, you have Windows or you have Apple Crash and you have the option to say, hey, send this off to, uh, back to Redmond or Cupertino or whatever. I mean, obviously you don't send it. But then if you're lucky enough to get kind of that, that you know, like the info and look. I mean, can anybody interpret the stack trace on a Windows app and understand kind of what happened there? I mean, you do? Okay, well, hey, w welcome. Well, here you go. Uh, uh, but in all seriousness, I mean, most of, you, uh, most of us can't. And if it's a custom application that you're not familiar with, you're, you're like, well, great, you threw me a bunch of data. What the hell am I supposed to do with this? So part of it is talking to them saying, I, this is what I need. I don't need everything. I need it came from here, it came, this is what it looks like in a way that, that is eight or nine fields that I can look and do a quick snapshot and say, okay, that's bad, that's good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad, that's good. Because again, when, once the, the stuff hits the fan, you can't interpret a log file. Like, thank you for sending me like a meg worth of text. I have to sit there and go through it or, you know, grep for keywords or do whatever, but you, you can't, it's too late to do anything uh, that so so what do you need? I'm going to dive into this. What you know? What does fidelity of security logging mean? And, and I'm going to start out high and get low. Uh, what, when, where, how? You know what it, what what it was, what, where it came from, uh, what port? Uh, you know what part of the system it accessed? Those are all important things. And the key is you may not want to know much more. So the key in logging, and this is uh, you know our ac application intelligence information whatever, is to start start simple and stupid and then work up from there. Uh, we see it frequently, but not, not, not as frequently as we used to, but we, we've been in clients where they have intrusion detection deploy. Hey, we have intrusion detection, network intrusion detection. You're like, awesome. And you look at their, you know, ask more questions, they find out they have a, a box, always a box, located outside the firewall. 
So you're like, that's awesome. You're uh, <clears throat> logging the entire internet, all the attacks on the internet. And when was the last time you've looked at, I mean, they're, 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 their logs roll over. They're not, they basically have a device. They've checked a box, uh, not to pick on PCI, but, but I'm saying like that, that happens. Like if you're not looking at the information from what modest logs you have or what information you have, why on earth would you do any of this? So the first thing is look, look at basic information. Key events are when people are accessing uh, the application and what part of the application. Think of, again, those are network activities, authentication, authorization, access, but look at it from the application level as well. What, what, what's being passed into the app and what's being passed out. Uh, there is, if you were to read nothing else, there's a couple of great sources. Uh, uh, the, the How to Do Application Logging Rights, a, a great white paper. There's also an OWASP. Uh, site on this. If you do nothing else after this meeting, after this presentation, go read those two because they're exceptional. So, what kind of things do you want to log? Again, starting out real simple, maybe even you may want to pick one or two of these. And once you understand and have built them into your day to day tempo, because unless you've got a person or maybe have volunteered to do this yourself, don't do this unless you have somebody on at least a daily basis to say, I'm going to look at this stuff. I'm going to you know, get my cup of coffee, I'm going to spin up my computer, and it Eight o'clock in the morning, I'm going to look to see what happened the night before. Or, I've, you know, if you can't even do that on a 24-hour basis, don't do any of this stuff. But if once you get to that, then you can start kind of amping it up and add, adding more things. So certainly, input validation, output validation. What's coming in? What's going out? That's that's probably the biggest thing that you want to do. And then authentication successes and failures, or multiple successes or excuse me, multiple failures. Like you want to know if somebody's trying to. Um, access your stuff on the application layer. Because one of the things, like if you understand a SQL injection, part of what you're trying to do is tweak the payload to hit pay dirt. You're trying to get that payload perfect. And if you're not looking and logging this type of activity at the application level, you may not get uh, on the network level that, that, that information that says, hey, somebody's trying, is, 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 is doing some interesting thing at the app level. So you can go down, after you've done that session management stuff, application errors and system events, again, Keep it real simple, be able to interpret, digest, and act upon what you get, and then work from there. Uh, and then, you know, legal and opt-ins where it matters in certain high, highly regulated environments. Our other high-risk uh, functionality are admin logins or failed admin logins, all those things. But, but start simple and go from there. Uh, and then for each event, this is a starting point, and you can turn up or turn down this. Obviously, when the event was logged, I mean, that's important. <laughs> uh, you know, you assign a date to it, uh, interaction, what app, what part of the app it talked to, what page, if that's if it's a web application, what from what TCP service it came from, uh, you know, what user ID accessed it or tried to access it, and then what type of event. So these, this is all from the OWASP application logging cheat sheet. Great starting point. Again, two documents, this and the Gunnar Peterson article. If you read nothing else, I'd re recommend you do this. But the, okay, so now you're starting to get some certain level of information and you can start to interpret uh, and, 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 and figure out. But you have got to tell the dev manager or the dev team lead, this is what I need. And I need it for these type of events over here and, and, and nothing else to start with. Uh, and, and, and work your way up from there. Because if, again, if you, if you don't have the information and then can't interpret it and can't act on it, uh, it's better probably not to even look at it at that point. And I would say in most enterprise environments, I would say, a good half don't do this at all. I mean, they just put it out there and they say, hey, we have a WAF. You know, so I'll ask the, uh, the great WAF question for the record. How many people have worked with or have WAFs in their environments? You can raise your hands higher. How many people have, uh, or, or keep them down either way, how, how many people have uh, rule blocking implemented on their WAFs? Two. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, the reason I ask that question is a lot of people have bought WAFs for, you know, for, for compliance purposes, and, a, and a, a smaller subset have used them to block stuff or to interpret the data off of layer seven. But the, one argument is they are wonderful tools for doing this stuff, particularly if you didn't get these questions into the development team prior. So if you didn't ask any of these questions and you didn't get your application developers to build this stuff to kick out from the custom software systems, WAFs become a bigger player, and we'll talk about that in a second. So this is the kind of information uh, uh, that you want to do, the emphasis on keeping it simple. Information never to log, another key point. 
this stuff sounds so blindingly simple that I'm embarrassed to even throw it out there Friday at, in the, at 4.30 in the afternoon. But it's true. You don't want to log passwords. Don't want to log somebody's credit card data. Don't want to log EPI. It happens, and it happens frequently. How, how many folks have worked with uh, clients or in your own environments where they use actual live data for test data? Is that bad or good? Bad, 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 bad. So, so, you know, this, so if you're doing that, is it unusual to say that this might happen? I mean, this does happen frequently. So particularly if you're in a, like a PCI environment where you're trying to limit scope of what, what's in scope for PCI compliance, like why would you log this stuff to make the logs more in scope? So these are things that you don't want to put out um, <laughs> uh, ever. And make sure if you've got uh, like a SharePoint environment that you're not crawling SharePoint or if you've got Google, uh, you know, uh, if you've got one of those uh, Google appliances in your environment that you're not like crawling these logs either because that's when you're going to find out whether or not you did this. So, okay, so here's an example of, uh, I'll give you a couple code snippets of where you can do that. So when, uh, do it well. So when you, somebody fails to log in, you're going to escape the username, you're going to log what happened, you're going to do it over and over. And this is even better. Um, and you're going to log what happened, where it happened, and how. Again, a little bit more information. Uh, let me go back there. But th this is an example of what, like now you're starting to get a little bit of context and you're not doing dumb things. Um, so I talked about WAFs real quickly, and I, uh, you know, this is an OWASP conference, so it's, you know, I think the tendency is to beat up on WAFs, but this is where WAF, there is a strong business case for web application firewalls. Even if, like, your audit department bought it and, you, you know, nobody's really looking at it, this, is, this might be a, a paid-for and unutilized gem to do application logging. And that's because, I mean, they really give you uh, application layer visibility that, or in a lot of places where you don't have it. Um, and, and so it, you can start to see patterns of attack, particularly a SQL injection where people are tuning payloads to try to get in. That's where you can start to see. Now, I, I won't ask this question again, but like a lot of people have WAFs. How many people interpret the rule, the law, the things that kick out or the alerts that kick out of the WAFs? I, you know, I, most of the time it's a subset of people uh, that do that. Maybe I'm looking over at you, I'm picking on you. Uh, but, but, I mean, there are, there are fewer clients that have WAFs that actually look at them daily and look at alerts. And alerting, meaningful log reduction and alerting and getting the thresholds for reporting are very difficult things to, to tune. But this is an example where I'd say most people that are PCI vendors, retail folks, uh, they have these. In like, and, and you'd be surprised that the application security folks are not tapping into that data stream. Uh, you may not be doing blocking, but you've still got access to the data. So finding out where that is and getting that information uh, is, is a strong recommendation. Um, so there's other things. So, so again, these are examples of I didn't get any of these requirements into the dev team. I really don't have anything. I'm just looking at what's happening in the uh, you know, application layer of traffic. Another interesting project, how many people are familiar with AppSensor? Michael Coates out of uh, Mozilla, uh, actually president of OWASP, was very instrumental in this, still very uh, uh, influential. But what AppSensor does is it, it's a framework, and it basically create, it looks at a lot of things that never should happen in application-level attacks. Like if you're starting to see uh, certain types of activity, and I'll give you these examples. Um, an, an example that is numerous probes and tries to, uh, like I mentioned, the, the, the trying to craft a payload for SQL injection is a great example. You start to see patterns of activity. This is stuff that goes through a regular firewall as port 80 or 443 traffic that we just drop. We don't care about. We just, it's background noise. So what AppSensor basically does is says there's certain types of background noise that for me is interesting and might be an alert to something weirder that I need to look at. So again, uh, and this is something that's instrumented in application, application servers. And these are examples of uh, the type of bad behaviors. There's about 50 of them that you know, you, there's a uh, HTTP get when you're expecting a post in the reciprocal. I mean, that's, that's, that's unusual, that's weird. Um, you know, unexpected HTTP commands. It's really essentially saying there's some things that should never happen, and if they do, I'd like to know about it. And then maybe, again, that gives me the ability, that pregnant pause to go and say, maybe I need to look at more stuff. Let me go look, you know, I, maybe I get the logs from my WAF once a week. Maybe just look at, log in today, you're looking for, indicators at the application level of, of somebody knocking the heck out of your application or doing certain things. 
Uh, the other one is, how many people are uh, familiar with virtual patching uh, that's out there? Okay, so virtual patching is an ability to push a, a essentially a, a block on web application firewalls or, or some of the web uh, smart application vol uh, firewalls that essentially blocks a URL while you're fixing it, uh, while you're fixing a, a, a vulnerable application, I should say. So one of the interesting things you can do is you can say, look, okay, there's a SQL injection at this help login or some kind of login uh, part in the back of my site. You can push this WAF uh, virtual patch and it's out there. All the WAFs will tell you how many people try to hit that vulnerable site after. So now you're starting to see, okay, in my login for my HR backend portal, there was a SQL injection. Let me block that until we fix this. But wow, I, I pushed out this virtual patch on Monday, Monday night. There were 120 people that tried to hit that site over the weekend. Some, somehow, somebody's aware of that now. That is more than random stuff. And it can allow you to get context of what is out on your site. What has been vulnerable is, is patched in the short term, but what, who's trying to touch that in the interim? Uh, so there are application, uh, like I said, aware uh, uh, vulnerable, or excuse me, web application firewalls that do that, mod security F5 and Perva. I think it's the white hat guys uh, push uh, vulnerability uh, reporting to these. Uh, I think Veracode does that. Um, and then we, uh, Denim Group actually released an open source uh, tool called ThreadFix that allows you to do that import tools as well. So this is, a, this is kind of if you follow the DevOps stuff that is being kind of uh, discussed in some of the other sessions, this is getting uh, kind of towards that near real time uh, you know, world where you're like, hey look, I, I have a two week cycle with my dev team. I can't fix something because I don't control those guys. But what I can do is I can block that or push that vulnerable site to somewhere else. And while I'm doing that, I get some information and context of uh, who's hitting. Is it, was that really a problem or is that something I should not worry about? So that's something, that's another way that you can get some level of information in deployed applications that are out there that maybe you didn't instrument this stuff in prior. So that's another stretch. So anyhow, I'm gonna wrap up here with uh, plenty of time uh, to go here. Uh, I've, uh, I've got the slide deck uh, that I'll send out. Obviously, I'm going to leave it uh, for everybody. If you want uh, to email me or call me or Twitter me, if you're super lonely and want to follow me on Twitter, uh, that's, that's me. But seriously, DM me and I'll send you the deck in PDF format. But essentially, uh, if you had to do anything else, I would uh, look at the Gunnar Peterson article and then also the OWASP blogging cheat sheet, which is up on the phenomenal resources. Anyhow, well, I, th I appreciate you, uh, you know, listening up and being the hardcore supporters here at the last. Uh, again, DM me or email me, and I'll send you the slide deck. And if you have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you.